good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Chris Gobler. I am speaking tonight. I'm also um, the Director of Academic Programs for the School of Marine Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University uh, here in Southampton. And uh, so on behalf of the school, I welcome you to our spring 2015 seminar series. Uh, I'm the second in a line of four speakers this spring, so I'll just point out that uh, Friday, May 1st, we're going to have Daniel Madigan from SOMAS speaking about mercury accumulation in fish in the ocean, and he's a world's expert in that. Uh, and then on June 5th, again a Friday, we'll have one of our new faculty members, Niels Vogelbaum. Uh, his title of his seminar is Beneath the Surface, How Burrowing Organisms Affect the Function of the Sea Floor. Um, so as we continue to try to bring you the best science uh, to here on the East End. Um, so with that, I welcome you to my seminar. Um, and I see the room is filled. That's great to see. I see lots of young people standing, and I hope that's the way it stays. So if people a little bit older wanted to sit, those seats are available. Um, and I guess with that, I'm just going to get started. Uh, this is a presentation uh, that I call The State of the Bays. And the title this year, as you can see, is Crisis and Opportunity. You know, I, and I was uh, maybe a little hesitant to word the, use the word crisis, and maybe we can talk about that as I go through. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging all the students in my lab group. Um, as you probably saw outside, there's more than 10 uh, posters. or No, not more than 10. There's exactly 10 uh, posters that are put together by graduate students and technicians uh, who work in my research lab. And I, I know many of you saw those already. I encourage you, after the presentation, they'll be back there. I'll probably present, uh, in fact, everything I present will be their data. Uh, sad to say, they're the boots in the ground. They're the ones doing all the great work. So if you like what you see tonight, you can thank them, because it were not for their very hard, continuous effort, uh, we wouldn't have the data we're talking about today. And so you can meet them firsthand uh, afterwards. And so I'm going to start uh, today just to give you a brief overview where I'm just going to talk about water in general, uh, talk about some of the science about nitrogen loading and its effects on our coastal ecosystems, uh, talk about how water circulation patterns affect our coastal ecosystems, and then talk about ways of addressing uh, nitrogen loading to our coastal ecosystems as well. Uh, before I begin, I should say we've got many of our elected officials here in the room. I know the supervisor is here. I know we have two of our trustees here, both um, uh, Ed Warner and Scott Horowitz. Uh, and I know we have people from the Town Sustainability uh, Committee, Dieter and Scott. Uh, so I thank all of you for coming. I'm probably forgetting other important people. You're all important to me because the science is, uh, it's for everybody. So uh, I do thank you all for coming. And so I'm actually going to start with a video. I've never done this before, but I think in some ways, you'll see if you can how quickly you can guess the speaker. It, in some ways, it sets the tone. So let's start with just this. that wasn't too much drama, but in some ways I, I feel like something like that 
uh, sets the, the tone for you know, what Long Island is really all about. Um, you know, we're an island surrounded by water. Uh, we rely on our groundwater as our sole source for drinking water. Uh, and you know, why do people come to Long Island? Of course, you've heard this before. Do we come for the taxes? Do we come for the traffic? Um, you know, no, we're here for the beauty of our coastal waters and our coastal ecosystems. Uh, and we appreciate the bounty of Long Island's great fisheries. Um, and also the richness of our maritime culture. You know, I think sometimes we often forget where we, you know, from whence we came. This rich tradition of fisheries isn't just something that's going on today, but you know, whaling and the Menhaden fishery that went back to the 1700s, oysters through the 1800s, the incredible clam industry of the 1900s. It's, it's what Long Island has been about for centuries. Uh, and if we look where we are today, uh, things are very different. And again, I'm not sure we can argue whether the word crisis is right or not, but let's see where we are today. Uh, you know, the scenes of beauty are different today. And this is not a scene of beauty, but this is uh, Nassau County and the beaches of Nassau County just last summer. Uh, and here's Shinnecock Bay again just last summer. Uh, and Peconic Bay in the fall. Uh, and so these are not the scenes of beautiful Long Island waters that we, uh, we've come to know and love. Uh, and beyond what things look like, we know our habitats are changing as well. We know how important things like seagrass beds are for Long Island's coastal ecosystems. And we know that we've lost a lot of our seagrass beds, 90% estimated by the DEC. And again, the Suffolk County says that we, they could be extinct and gone by the year 2030. Uh, and we know how valuable an acre of seagrass bed is with regards to fisheries. And so that's a lot of income we've left on the table by losing these seagrass beds. We know that some of our important fin fisheries are on the decline. Uh, and you know, a lot of fisheries migrate, a lot of fish migrate a lot, and it's difficult to pin it on a Long Island ecosystem. But we now know that winter flounder, a lot of those populations are resident year round. So here's a good example of something that is effective by our coastal ecosystems. Uh, and this fishery is really on the ropes. Some scientists think it's not going to be around for much longer. That, that, those are scientists from Stony Brook talking about this fishery right here. Uh, and then, of course, we know the richness of our shell fisheries. Uh, New York, historically, has had the greatest shell fisheries in the history of this nation. Uh, read The Big Oyster. You'll hear all about how the oyster fishery in New York was the biggest ever in the history of this country. We know that most of the hard clams eaten in, from uh, on the east coast of the U.S. came out of Great South Bay in the 70s. And we know we had the largest bay scallop fishery uh, on Long Island back in the 80s. Uh, but we also know how much these fisheries have declined uh, when it comes to clams, oysters, mussels, declines in only 30 years of between 70 and 90 some odd percent. And that's an impact on our economies. Uh, and it's not just the fishermen, because the, when we had these great industries, there's a whole trickle down that goes with that. That is the connections to the seafood industry, to the restaurants, uh, that in many cases we don't have. And of course, we also know that those sorts of shellfish are very important for the entire ecosystem. They're called keystone species because of their ability to filter the water, keep the water clear, control the nitrogen cycle, and import, uh, provide important habitat to coastal fisheries. And so, in some ways, you could make the argument that we're losing our maritime culture here that we've had for centuries uh, because these shell fisheries and fin fisheries just aren't there. And I think as my kids grow up, I think they're experiencing a different Long Island today than I had and that many of you had because these fisheries just aren't there. Uh, and, you know, again, that's, that's where we came from for centuries. So how did we get here to this point where these fisheries are all on the ropes, our habitats are in decline? Well, as I think we're all aware, but just to review, all of Long Island is a watershed. So any water hitting the land, uh, eventually, in some way, is going to find its way first into our, either into our aquifer and then to our coastal ecosystems, or simply into our coastal waters. And some data shows how quickly that, that can occur. So here's some data showing that when it rains, within a matter of only an hour of consistent rain, that water's already traveled more than four feet down into our aquifer. Uh, so it's happening, the effect from land into our uh, drinking water and our aquifer can be very quick. And of course, we know how the water cycle works, just as a reminder, I like this video, because it essentially just shows 
uh, again, emphasizing that point, the whole of Long Island is a watershed. And either the water's hitting the land and running off, but we actually know that most of it's hitting our aquifer and then coming out into our coastal systems. Uh, and there's a delay there in how that happens, but eventually it does seep out. And we know how things have changed in Suffolk County. So there's the population growth for Suffolk County over the last century or so. We're now more populous than Nassau County, uh, and the growth continues. Um, and there's the nitrogen levels in the groundwater below our feet, the upper glacial aquifer, which we know hits our coastal ecosystems. Now, I've been showing this figure for a few years, but not with this last data point. I've just been sort of, there was a report from Suffolk County that showed the big leap from 85 to 2005, excuse me, 87 to 2005. And with that leap, there was a lot of concern amongst people. Uh, but the new data shows that trend line is just continuing. It continues to rise. Uh, and so there's a delay between the growth here and this rise, but we expect, based on models, that this rise is going to continue going forward. And, you know, a lot of people are worried about nitrogen here in Long Island, but I just want to point out that that's not an isolated view. This paper just came out a couple of months ago in the greatest uh, scientific journal, Science. Uh, and you can see what it's called, Planetary Boundaries, uh, Guiding Human Development in a Changing Planet. And essentially, they're looking at all potential stressors for planet Earth. And look what they place nitrogen, the potential biggest threat to planet Earth uh, when it comes to environmental stressors. So, you know, it's, our concern here is, is, is local, but this is a, a concern that's shared around the world. And so why do we worry about it? Well, I'm sure, as I showed in some of those photographs, harmful algal blooms are a significant concern here on Long Island. We have two classes, some that can make individual toxins uh, that can make people sick via the consumption of shellfish or, or can make animals sick via just the direct drinking of the water. So, for example, dogs drinking fresh water that might have uh, blue-green algae. And then another class of harmful algal blooms shown here uh, are very harmful to our ecosystem and can result in the die-off of either finfish or shellfish. And in fact, have been responsible for some of our losses of these shell fisheries. And 2014, as I showed in a couple of photographs, uh, was unfortunately not a remarkable year for harmful algal blooms. It was about normal. What this is showing is the areas of harmful algal blooms, different types that occurred in 2014 on the south shore, the north shore, the east end. It's also showing areas of low oxygen that we'll talk about later. Um, but this, unfortunately, has become a standard issue. This was 2014, but we've seen this in past years as well. And I think most people know this, but I just want to emphasize, you can see the title of this paper, Eutrophication and Harmful Algal Blooms, a Scientific Consensus. So when it comes to harmful algal blooms, you can see the first point that these scientists came up with. Uh, and this was led by the US EPA. Uh, the idea that degraded water quality for nutrient pollution, pollution promotes the expansion of harmful algal blooms. And their final point, that the management of nutrient pollution in a watershed can lead to the significant reduction in these harmful algal blooms. So that's the national and global view. Here on Long Island, we've done many studies on all of these different harmful algal blooms. And in every case, there are strong links between excessive nitrogen loading and either these blooms being more abundant or more toxic, or in some cases, both. And what I'd like to talk to you about briefly now is to drill down on one particular incidence, and that's actually cyanobacteria blooms, also known as blue-green algae, that occur in freshwater ecosystems, uh, which we sometimes forget here on Long Island, but we do have many lakes and ponds. Uh, and the reason these uh, blooms are of concern is because the type of toxins they can make that can poison animals. Uh, we had a dog death in East Hampton a few years back, and that was actually uh, been confirmed by the State uh, Department of Health. Um, back originally, but then again reconfirmed in the last year. Now, we're lucky on Long Island. We don't need to rely on our surface waters for drinking water, but in some places they do. And the places where they do, there are actually strong correlations between gastrointestinal cancers and the consumption of water with these toxins. So this is a significant concern globally. Uh, and again, locally, they, uh, the concern is more with regard to animals. Last year, the CDC released a report giving evidence of more than 400 cases of dog poisonings from these blue-green algal blooms. Uh, and they admitted that what they reported was likely a very small fraction of the total because it's difficult to get those sorts of records. Uh, but it's a common occurrence. This summer, if you're curious, go to Google News and punch in blue-green algae and dog. And unfortunately, you'll probably find some hits. Try it in August or uh, September. The biggest area for these blue-green algal blooms in the US is in the Great Lakes, and specifically in Lake Erie. And uh, sometimes in late summer in Lake Erie, the water can look like this. And last summer, 
uh, Lake Erie made the news because what you're looking at here, it's a blue-green algal bloom. This is the T city of Toledo's water intake within Lake Erie. And you may have heard in the news they had an incident where for about a week they couldn't use their tap water because it was contaminated with these cyanobacterial toxins. And so it, this is an issue in the United States, thankfully not here in Long Island, but cases where uh, these toxins are getting through the filtration systems and getting into the public water supply. And for that reason, the DEC is now taking blue-green algal blooms very serious in the state of New York. They have a very robust monitoring program. They're looking at all 62 counties in New York State, looking for the presence of these blue-green algal blooms. And for good reason, across Lake Erie and also Lake Ontario, there are many places where people are getting their drinking water right out of the Great Lakes. And further, if you look at New York on a whole, Here's a lake of many, many, a state with many lakes, both the Great Lakes, the Finger Lakes, and all sorts of other lakes all up and down the state. So you might guess, where are these blue-green algal blooms most common in all of New York State? And you might be surprised to learn that the answer is in Suffolk County. Uh, so there are more incidences of blue-green algal blooms reported in Suffolk County than any county in New York State last year. So 40 of 62 counties came up positive. So you know, these, again, they're out there and looking for them, but there are more incidences here in Suffolk County than all these other locations. And it also goes with regard to the duration of these events, if you add up how many weeks they were reported. And further, the lakes that were listed for the most extended period of time through the year, five of the top 15 were here in Suffolk County. So why is this happening? Well, for many years, there's been a connection between high levels of phosphorus and these blue-green algal blooms. Uh, and for good reason. What this data set shows is as you get to this TP is total phosphorus. When you get to very high levels, lakes tend to be dominated by cyanobacteria. However, that's total phosphorus. And that's something in science we would call an autocorrelation. Because the total phosphorus actually includes the phosphorus in the cyanobacteria. And so people have been reconsidering this paradigm recently. And in fact, just two months ago, the EPA issued a new report uh, essentially emphasizing the idea that when you want to control these blue-green algal blooms, you need to consider not just the phosphorus, but also the nitrogen. Because that's the only way you'll get these events under control. And uh, I can state that within this report, they actually cited a couple of papers that came out of our lab, lab group and some data that came out of right here in Suffolk County. And so why, what is the story with nitrogen? Well, this is a, uh, a study done by a former graduate student that I want to bring back and just emphasize where he would ameliorate or add different levels of either nitrogen or phosphorus to water and see what happened to the cyanobacteria that were either toxic or non-toxic. And when he added nitrogen, he got the strongest response out of the toxic strains of microcystis. So in any given ecosystem, the cyanobacteria will have some cells that can make the toxins and some that cannot. And so his finding was the more nitrogen that went into the system, the more the system shifted over to one where there's more toxic than non-toxic cells. Another thing to talk about with regard to nitrogen and microcystis blooms is work by the soon-to-be Dr. Matthew Harkey, standing in the back of the room. He'll be a doctor within uh, the next few weeks or so, but his dissertation has looked very carefully at these microcystis blooms and their link with nitrogen. Uh, this first study he did uh, looked at, had different treatments, a laboratory study, different sorts of nutrients uh, that had different levels of this DIN, dissolved inorganic nitrogen. And so what he found is that amongst all the different treatments, the ones with the lowest levels of nitrogen, the lowest levels of nitrogen, ah, here we go, um, had the lowest levels of microcystin, and also had the down regulation of the genes responsible for making that toxin. Uh, and in some ways, maybe this isn't surprising. The molecule, microcystin, that toxin, has eight nitrogen atoms in it. It's a nitrogen-rich compound. You need a lot of nitrogen in order to make the toxin. He did another experiment where he grew a culture with, over time, with lots of nitrogen or low nitrogen. The culture with low nitrogen had less toxin. He added in nitrogen, and the toxin levels doubled. And then finally, in the same exact experiment, he also looked at the genes being up, upregulated or downregulated. And under low nitrogen, the genes turn off. He has the nitrogen back, the genes turn on. So nitrogen is controlling the toxicity of these blue-green algal blooms uh, right here in Suffolk County. 
Uh, and then further, the last set of data said he actually went to Lake Erie. Uh, he's actually made several trips there and did an experiment where he added phosphorus or nitrogen and again looking at those genes by adding the nitrogen the genes turn on and further of the two nitrogen compounds he selected when he added urea a nitrogen containing compound uh, it significantly increased the amount of toxin so when we see more of these toxic blooms in Suffolk County nitrogen is part of the story for sure okay we're at the point of the talk where we'll all take a deep breath in, a deep breath out, and congratulations, you are respiring. And that sort of respiration goes on in marine ecosystems all the time. Uh, and as it turns out, the amount of respiration that goes on in an ecosystem is going to be dependent on the amount of organic matter from phytoplankton that goes into that ecosystem. So more nitrogen, more phytoplankton, more organic matter, more respiration, lower oxygen or a condition known as hypoxia. And so the DEC wants to make sure uh, that all of our coastal water bodies have not less than three milligrams per liter to support fisheries. They've done the studies, larval fish and other larval invertebrates are highly sensitive to low levels of oxygen. And so we collected some data last year that made it into the news. Here's a study by Newsday. Two-thirds of Long Island's coastal waters lack enough oxygen for fish to survive. We also made it into the funny papers. So I'll read this to you, which says, humankind's insatiable search for signs of life in the universe, sending going into deep space or looking at our shallow coastal waters. And note, here's the, and I don't know how much this really looks like me, but it does say, <laughs> Stony Brook Marine Bio Labs, nitrogen high, oxygen low. Anyway, uh, so what was the fuss here that uh, the cartoonist was talking about? Well, before I get into the details, I want to point one very important thing out to you. Um, during the day, of course, oxygen is produced via the process of photosynthesis, and oxygen levels are high. But at night, when there's no light, the only thing going on is respiration, and oxygen levels get quite low. And so what we see in our coastal ecosystems when we put out devices that make continuous measurements is that oxygen levels can be quite high during the day, quite low sometimes at night. Now, you may know this, but the agencies that monitor for oxygen, when they send the boats out to do that, they're not doing the midnight shift. They're going out during the day. And for many years, what we found is that, or the data shows, is the oxygen levels are really quite high. But we've started to put out these devices and found out that actually there's a lot of wiggle to that data. And that wiggle up and down is not the instrument having problems. That's the reality of photosynthesis by day and only respiration by night. So here's Fire Island Inlet, very well flush with ocean water, a lot of wiggle, but well above that three milligram per liter standard. Here's closer to uh, the east end here, Three Mile Harbor, again, right out at the inlet, the day by day wiggle, but also well above the standard. But now when we go back to the back part of Three Mile Harbor, we see the same wiggle, but we also see we're getting well below that standard uh, for extended periods of time. In fact, every night during late summer. And there are other regions all across Long Island where we saw similar patterns, places like Cold Spring Harbor, for example, uh, the Peconic River. And so we actually surveyed more than 30 sites across Long Island, uh, and as you can see, all over, talk more about this data set later. And if you see any site that's red or black, that's a site that fell below that standard. Uh, again, it's the standard the DEC says, and they say that shall not go below. And I carefully have looked at that standard and the memo written about that standard. And so it's very, the, the language is very clear. And so we've got many places that are experiencing those low oxygen levels. So I told you that high levels of nitrogen are promoting low oxygen. What about when you reduce nitrogen levels, does that help? Well, scientists decided that long ago. And in fact, in 1994, the Long Island Sound study was put forth to reduce nitrogen levels in Long Island Sound by 60%. Uh, and at great cost, the sewage treatment plants, New York State, and in Connecticut. Um, so is that helping? Well, in the first decade or so, there was a lot of hand-wringing because people got, were getting very angry, we're putting all this effort, and things aren't getting any better. But if you look at what's been happening for the last 12 years, things are turning around. Uh, so here's the 12-year trend in the area of Long Island Sound that's been, that was hypoxic year by year. And you can see, again, there's year by year 
variability, uh, but a significant trend with regards to the area that's hypoxic as these nitrogen levels go down. Now to a marine organism, what's important is not just the area, but the duration of these low oxygen levels. And that's what's shown here. So it's the area times the number of days that they're experiencing low oxygen level. And this trend is even stronger. So in an ecosystem where nitrogen levels are being reduced, the oxygen levels uh, are going up and the hypoxia is going down. So nitrogen reduction can be important for improving water quality right here in New York. Okay, take a deep breath again. <coughs> and you can breathe out and we're still respiring, but I wanna now focus on the second part of this reaction. And the fact that when you respire, not only are you consuming oxygen, but you're producing carbon dioxide. And there's been a lot of concern about the production of carbon dioxide uh, in recent decades because of a process you've probably heard of, ocean acidification. Whereby when we get more carbon dioxide in our water, the bottom line is that produces more hydrogen ions, which reduces the pH of our water. And this is a process that's ongoing, it's global, um, and there's a lot of concern. In fact, I can say that Twice in the last year, I was called to Washington, D.C., and I, I was involved in briefings of both the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate because they're very concerned and worried and interested in understanding ocean acidification uh, because it's a national issue. But what we're learning locally is that beyond the ocean acidification that is coming from our atmosphere, we need to worry about the acidification that actually is related to nutrient and nitrogen loading. Remember, that same process that leads to the consumption of oxygen, nutrients stimulate an algal bloom that decays and leads to low oxygen, also produces CO2. And that production of CO2 is the same acidification that happens from the atmosphere. And so again, Newsday got interested in the idea of acidification in Long Island Sound. And that's because of this data set uh, generated by, well, Ryan's here somewhere. Uh, which showed that that same area of low oxygen that I told you is getting smaller, concurrent with the low oxygen conditions, just as would be predicted, we're finding very low levels of pH uh, and very high levels of CO2. In fact, higher than is predicted for the atmosphere and the open ocean uh, for hundreds of years from now due to the combustion of fossil fuels. So very intense acidification, again, associated with high levels of nitrogen. This is a seasonal phenomenon. So what this shows here is the changes in dissolved oxygen from spring going into fall. And what you can see is that hypoxic zone, the low oxygen, occurs in late summer and then goes away. But if you look at the acidification, it's more widespread through Long Island Sound. It starts earlier and it lasts longer. And remember, I showed you all those sites with low oxygen. All the sites with low oxygen are also experiencing acidification. So for example, the Forge River, here's the relationship between pH and dissolved oxygen. They're spread to the data, but if you just look at the red, that's what's happening in the Forge River. And so when we're seeing low oxygen, we're also seeing low pH. We did a simple experiment where we added carbonate to the water to just raise the pH and not change the oxygen at all. And when we did that, and we put either larval base scallops in that water or larval fish in that water, what we found is that the survival rates of these organisms by fixing the pH went up substantially, which says that this acidification that's happening now is likely an impairment to both fin fish and shellfish. But not all organisms will be negatively affected by high levels of CO2. One of our harmful algal bloom species is this one, Alexandrium, that makes that toxin that can get the shellfish, um, and it's a problem throughout Long Island. Uh, we know, for example, in 2012, we had 13,000 acres of shellfish beds closed because of the presence of this toxin. We also know this species is widespread throughout Long Island uh, on the North Shore, the South Shore, the East End. Now, previous work by Dr. Teresa Hattenrath has shown that excessive nitrogen loading enhances both the growth and the toxicity of this organism. But Teresa was also then interested in understanding how high levels of CO2 affect this organism. And she had an isolate that she got from Northport here in Long Island and grew it at two levels of carbon dioxide and found that when grown under the high levels of CO2, it grew at a faster rate and also accumulated twice as much toxin as opposed to being grown at normal levels. She repeated this result in the field, collecting natural populations and growing it at different levels of CO2 and found that they grew faster under higher levels of CO2. 
And this makes sense scientifically. This is a plant, and in fact, the dinoflagellate is a very ancient uh, organism, it evolved over 500 million years ago when CO2 levels were actually high. So by giving it high CO2, you're sort of bringing it back to its roots, so to speak. She also found in North Port Harbor, the regions with the most number of cells also had the highest levels of CO2. Uh, so it's, it's associated with high CO2 within an ecosystem setting. So it's not just the nitrogen that's promoting this bloom, but the CO2 that could be a co secondary consequences of high nitrogen is also promoting these events. And so we need to think about the idea that both the nutrients and the CO2 can, prevent, can promote these events, and the idea that both the CO2 on its own or combined with these harmful algal blooms can be detrimental to our fisheries. Now, just last month, an opinion piece was written by the uh, National uh, Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, you can see here, a threat to Long Island Sound economy. Long Island Sound's economy is worth billions of dollars, and they're specifically talking about the acidification that's going on there. And you can see, uh, the opinion was, one thing is clear, acidification offers one more good reason to double down and reduce nitrogen loads into our coastal waters. And part of the rationale comes from this idea that the sleeping giants are awakening. That is to say, if you don't know, this is what's happening with CO2 in our atmosphere, and we've now passed the 400 parts per million threshold. This will keep going. We can't control that. That's a global issue. But we know we can control nitrogen loading on a local level. Uh, and that's why, if we double down now, we can at least begin to control the CO2 that's coming uh, from excessive nitrogen loading. So that's climate change. So what do you think is the most noticeable and clearest climate change signal in New York? Is it citification? What else could it be? Well, the National Climate Assessment came out last summer and pointed out some very interesting data with regards to rainfall. Now, the amount of rainfall falling in our region is not changing whatsoever. What is changing, however, is the fact that it's being delivered all at once. We're getting more intense events. So the rainfall is not being spread out as it was, but it's coming at large storms all together. And what you can see is we have an increase of more than 71% of these sorts of events. And those are important events because they're delivering all sorts of things from land to sea. Nitrogen, bacteria, and other sorts of things. And for those of you who don't know or don't remember, uh, last summer we set an all-time record for New York State when in just one day 16 inches of rain fell uh, in western Suffolk County. Interestingly, we got hardly anything out here, a little bit of rain. Uh, but this event was significant. Now, we were monitoring Great South Bay before and after that event and saw a significant plume of salinity dropping within this system uh, after rainfall event occurred and of course as expected shell fisheries were closed immediately after that uh, and we know for example this area of Great South Bay has a lot of problems with pathogenic bacteria if you don't remember Great South Bay was closed from shell fishing for more than two months following Hurricane Sandy because of continually elevated levels of pathogenic bacteria. I was worried with that rainfall event about a brown tide bloom not immediately but as an after effect because in 2013, we had a similar sort of thing. I told you these things are becoming more common. Eight inches of rain falling in one week. That's two months worth of rain, just falling in a two week period. And again, just to emphasize that this is really happening all at once, this huge rainfall event was followed by a big drought we had late in the summer. But a big rainfall event that dropped the salinity of Great South Bay led to nitrogen loading and a large algal bloom that lasted for a little while and then shortly thereafter, a brown tide took off. And so the water went from crystal clear to, well, billions of brown tide cells per liter. And sure enough, we did not have a brown tide bloom occur immediately after that rainfall event, but in the same exact way in 2014, two months later, we had an event of almost a million cells uh, per milliliter within Great South Bay. And for those of you who are keeping track, this year marks the 30th year of brown tides on the south shore of Long Island. Remember, we had it for only a few years in the Peconics, but they've become persistent in both Great South Bay and Quantuck Bay. A final ecosystem point I want to make is with regards to salt marshes, and specifically 
Arctic, as we all know, these are incredibly important ecosystems, both for supporting fisheries, for terrestrial mammals, and migratory birds. And they're also important to humans. They protect us against storms. And that's become very clear in the work that's been done since Hurricane Sandy. This shows a storm event in a coastal setting. This is the fringe of a marsh that's actually preventing breaking waves from coming close into homes. And so we've done some work uh, at Stony Brook looking at flooding from Hurricane Sandy. So here's a map made of all the flooding that occurred during Hurricane Sandy. And if we focus in on the Mastic Shirley area, just as an example, this is an area that actually has extensive salt marshes on both its uh, west and eastern shores. And each of these dots here are different homes. Here's the flooding that occurred during Hurricane Sandy. People were flooded. However, this salt marsh here held the line against all of these homes. It acts like a sponge. The same thing happened here. You can see the flooding did not get into the homes. It went into the salt marsh. That's what they do. Here's an, here's an example of what would happen with sea level rise projecting out to the end of the century. Same thing with the salt marshes intact. The homes are protected because, at least, not all of them, but many of these homes, you can see all of these, the salt marshes hold the line. Recently, it's become apparent that in the Northeast, when you have excessive nitrogen loading, salt marshes degrade. And this is what the roots of a salt marsh looks like when you give it too much nitrogen. The roots weaken and the salt marsh begins to decay. And we know that on the north shore, the south shore, the east end of both Nassau and Suffolk County, the losses of salt marshes have ranged from 20 up to 80 percent. And that's why just last year, the DEC issued this report, specifically saying that marshes provide protection against coastal flooding. And therefore, New York needs to consider supporting programs to reduce nitrogen loading into Long Island's south shore embayments. Again, the whole idea of protecting the south shore against flooding. And again, this is a report that was issued last April. And to give a second example of this very quickly, some of you may be aware of a project called The Hills that's proposed for East Quag. Uh, this is a project that is supposed to put uh, 118 homes and an 18-hole golf course in this large vacant space here, uh, and an area that's actually within the Pine Barrens. The southern extent of this property is only 1,000 feet from Weesuck Creek, with groundwater travel times of only five years from the property to Weesuck Creek. Now, Weesuck Creek is lined with salt marshes. You can see them in this picture here. In an aerial photograph on both the eastern and western banks, there are salt marshes. And I don't know if you can see via the contrast here, but here's the flooding in East Quag during Hurricane Sandy. And you can even see, if you can see through there, there's actually, there's the salt marshes. And so again, many streets were flooded. We had flooding all the way to and across Sunrise Highway, almost to Main Street. But again, these salt marshes that are intact were holding the line. Uh, and if we have excessive nitrogen loading, more nitrogen loading from development, we may lose these salt marshes, uh, and that would increase and enhance flooding. And that's why when we have land preserved, the levels of nitrogen are so low. And that's why it's so important to continue to preserve the open space that is left to maintain that and maintain the integrity of not only coastal ecosystems, but also salt marshes. OK, so early on, you saw the title of my talk was Crisis and Opportunity. Now, I've never done this before, but twice in one talk, I'm borrowing from John F. Kennedy. because. John F. Kennedy pointed out in one of his speeches that the Chinese word for crisis is made up of two symbols, and maybe some of you know this. The symbols are danger and opportunity. And so with the idea being that in a crisis, there is always going to be some opportunity. And so I think that, as I said to someone before this talk, in some ways the tide is turning. There are positive things happening amongst some of this gloom. So for example, in the last several years, there's been a significant gain via polling Long Island now are getting and understanding water quality issues and the water quality threats that exist. Significantly more so today than they did only a few years ago. We now have a governor, a county executive, and town supervisors who are champions of clean water. They're working to get funds to improve water quality. And in fact, have successfully done that. Hundreds of millions of dollars, federal funding, have come to and are coming to Long Island to improve our treatment of wastewater. And Suffolk County is accelerating the rate at which it's approving uh, household septic tanks and alternative systems. And we're understanding where and how to address the nitrogen loading issues. 
So let me talk a moment about that. For those of you who are not aware, in Suffolk County, we know where all that nitrogen is coming from. So here's a balance of where nitrogen comes from in Great South Bay, studied by Valiel and, Ken and Kinney. 70% coming from cesspools and septic tanks. Here another study, this is uh, by myself and a graduate student, 60% from Mauritius Bay and Shinnecock Bay coming from cesspools and septic tanks. The largest source for the Peconics, same amount. That's studied by the Nature Conservancy. And for the North Shore areas that are not uh, on sewage treatment, or even areas with sewage treatment plants, the majority of the nitrogen coming from cesspools and septic tanks. So maybe this isn't surprising when we recognize we have 360,000 cesspools and septic tanks all across Suffolk County. Uh, and if you didn't know that the next closest state in New York uh, has 50,000. So this is an enormous issue. Um, so you could ask the question, what are we going to do? A little pun there. Um, but, or rather, you can say, where are we going to start? And we're starting to get good information about the, re the regions that probably need this to be addressed first. So let me make a few points on that front. We've been, my lab group's been studying East Hampton pretty intensively the last couple of years. And one thing we've learned from East Hampton is the water quality in general is fabulous, with some exceptions. For example, Three Mile Harbor, I showed you the area of low, low oxygen um, earlier on. If you look at Three Mile Harbor, shown here, not only does it have one inlet, it has a second inlet. And so when you look at the head of the harbor, and we look at all different ecosystems that we've been monitoring, that's a region that's having the biggest problems with not only low oxygen, but also harmful algal blooms. On the ocean side, we've been looking at Georgica Pond. Now, this is an interesting ecosystem because the East Hampton Town Trustees open the pond to the ocean several times a year. This is what the pond looked like late last summer. This is the development of a macroalgal bloom that's actually floating on the surface of Georgica Pond. And uh, it began to decay through the summer. And as it decayed, if you look at the tinge of the water here, a blue-green algal bloom developed feeding off of the nutrients from the macroalgal bloom. And they had to close the entire pond to crabbing, which is actually a big blue crab fishery uh, within that pond. But as I told you, this system gets opened up to the ocean. Now, we watched this bloom develop through July and August. We saw this bloom intensify into September to very, very high levels of cyanobacteria. But we knew they were going to be opening the pond on October 15th, 2014. And so students were out looking at the levels of blue-green algae before the pond was opened. And this is how the levels look like thereafter. Dramatic reduction as the water gets flushed out into the ocean. That's the spatial view, or the, uh, and here's the temporal view. Levels of chlorophyll, the pond opens, and then the levels drop. So the bloom being flushed out of the system. We see the same sort of trends in the South Shore. Here's Mauritius and Shinnecock Bay. Here's distance from the ocean inlets there. And what you can see is the levels of algae or chlorophyll increase uh, significantly as you go away from the inlets. You see the same thing for nitrogen. And in fact, when we look at a whole host of parameters, nitrogen, brown tides, red tides, oxygen, water clarity, they all worsen as you go further into the estuary and the residence times lengthen. And in Great South Bay, we've been looking at the new inlet, which is having a significant impact in that part of the bay. And you can see on the incoming tide how it dilutes out the brown tide and how on the outgoing tide it flushes out the brown tide. And so we're learning that these regions near these ocean inlets are going to be less prone to eutrophication. We've also learned something about areas that have the most intense water quality problems. For those of you not aware, last summer we partnered with News 12 to do something we called the Long Island Water Quality Index, where we looked at more than 30 sites across Long Island. I think I'm going to skip this. Uh, and looked at multiple parameters, lined them up against federal and state standards, which made it very easy to give a quantitative ranking for different water bodies based on the data. We didn't have to make any decisions. We just let the state and federal regulations speak for themselves. So everything was ranked as either a good, fair, or poor based on those standards. And so last summer, every Thursday night in the weather forecast, you could have gotten the water quality report. And uh, I met with Bill Corbell, actually just a week ago, and, uh, and the president of News 12. They'll be running this again this summer, starting Memorial Day, going into Labor Day. Uh, where they'll be looking at water quality all across Long Island. 
And here are the final scores. We did this for months, multiple locations, multiple parameters, and you can see how things lined up. And what you see is a cluster along the south shore here of area that is of either fair or poor water quality. Now, we looked at this in another way last summer as well. My student Ryan ran something called the Adrian Block Cruises. Did you know? He, I think he told me. Adrian Block, of course, was the Dutch explorer who first discovered Hell Gate, or the passage across the East River into Long Island Sound and discovered Long Island was an island, not a peninsula. And so in doing these cruises, we measured all sorts of parameters. This is just pH. By using the research vessel from right here in Southampton and cruising all the way around the island and coming back. And so in many cases, measuring something like pH, the conditions were at the worst when you got to the city. Lots of sewage treatment plants, as expected. Now, how about algal blooms? Where are they worse? Well, you know, typically you'd imagine the city as well. Actually, that wasn't the case. When we looked at algal blooms during June, they were the worst all across New York right here in the area between Mauritius and Shinnecock. Or in July, same area, or also in Great South Bay, or in September. So again, lining up with our water quality reports, this region having significant water quality issues. Well, why is that? Well, firstly, we have the smallest tidal ranges in this area. You can see out in Long Island Sound, seven foot tidal range. The water comes in, the water goes out. Look at Great South Bay in some regions where it's less than a foot. That plays a significant role in water becoming stagnant. And also, we've done nitrogen loading studies to show on a per volume basis these bays are so shallow, only a meter or so, the nitrogen loading has a much heavier effect compared to a big water body, for example, like Long Island Sound. And so where do we start with hitting nitrogen loading? Well, certainly, this is an area that is receiving too much nitrogen loading and suffering the ill effects of that. And the last thing I'm going to mention right now is, you know, can we come up with a better solution for this, uh, for these septic tanks? And so I'll just mention something that's starting just now at Stony Brook, uh, a new center called the Center for Clean Water Technology. Last fall, Governor Cuomo came uh, to talk about coastal resiliency. And in this presentation he gave, he established the clean, Center for Clean Water Technology at Stony Brook University. And so the mission of this center is to try to come up with the technology to improve on our current alternative septic systems. Can we remove more nitrogen? Can we reduce the footprints? They're small. Can we make them easy to operate so that each person who has one doesn't have to be uh, the equivalent of a sewage treatment plant operator? And can we make the costs small? So traditionally, what most of us have in our backyards, uh, at best, in fact, is a septic tank and a leaching pool, which removes some nitrogen, but not very much. And I'm not going to give a chemistry lesson as I wrap things up here, but I'll just very quickly point out What's happening in that septic tank is the nitrogen is being converted to nitrate, which is very stable in our groundwater. It sticks around for decades. What we want to do is encourage a second process known as denitrification, which takes that nitrate and converts it into nitrogen gas, which is totally inert. And so there already are many alternative septic systems we're going to be exploring and looking at. Uh, and specifically, trying to decode what's going on in these systems, looking at that nitrogen cycle and trying to understand what are the rates of nitrogen removal, who's removing the nitrogen when it comes to microbes, and how can we maximize that price process uh, for improving the technology. And so one of the first things we'll be doing is actually working with Suffolk County. They're going to be installing 19 of these systems across Long Island, and we're going to be trying to better understand what's happening in those systems and how well they're working. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up. So as I tried to say from the very beginning, you know, we have a changing landscape here in Long Island when it comes to our relationship to our coastal waters uh, for the new generation of Long Islanders, uh, and which I think brings sort of an urgency uh, maybe to a crisis point where things uh, and motivation for changing the way things are going. I showed you that blue-green algal blooms are more common in Suffolk County than anywhere in New York State, that excessive nitrogen can make different algal blooms more toxic or more abundant, uh, that we have expanded regions and extensive regions of low oxygen, low pH, uh, that are widespread and are a detriment to our fisheries. Uh, 
we see that poorly flushed region of estuaries are most vulnerable to the ill effects of nitrogen loading and should probably be targeted first for nitrogen mitigation. And hopefully, as I mentioned, the Center for Clean Water Technology will work to develop solutions uh, to, to problems of excessive nitrogen loading via enhanced septic tanks. So with that, I'm going to end. I'll point you to this Facebook page. If you're interested in what we do, we do provide updates on things happening in coastal waters uh, through the summer. So I thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to take questions. Yes. Uh, the advanced septic tank technology that you showed for you know, our waste uh, and our landscape, uh, is it possible to model that process exploiting the nitrogen cycle in the tank in, let's say, an estuary, uh, like engineer landscape-based nitrogen cycle enhancing feature to our or where fresh water enters the soil. For, for sure, and there's all sorts of natural denitrification that goes on. And interestingly, it's most abundant in the habitats we value most. So for example, salt marshes are very good at denitrifying. Uh, and that begins to add things up. Where we've lost a lot of salt, mar salt marshes, we therefore have less denitrification. Uh, oyster reefs is another hot spot for denitrification. Uh, and shellfish beds in general. Um, so, th and therefore that gives double value to bringing back those sorts of habitats. Um, for the purposes of not just uh, for marine life, but also for enhancing nitrogen cycling and denitrification. Yes. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering uh, what people could do personally to help improve the water quality. And then I had a question too. I was wondering, I was impressed by your uh, slide showing that when the inlets open up, you get a lot of cleansing. I was wondering if you're aware of any communities that are doing something structurally, say, to connect the ocean to the bay so you get a regular flushing of um, uh, seawater. So on the first point, what individuals can do, I think, you know, I emphasize the septic tanks, and, uh, and that's certainly the biggest source. But of course, fertilizer is another source. So I think everybody can sort of do their own nitrogen budget, so to speak. And in fact, if things go as planned, I'm actually hoping on the town of South Haven's webpage to put up uh, it won't be quite an app, but a place where people can go to actually do their own nitrogen household budget and see where the nitrogen is coming from and see what kind of changes they can potentially make to reduce their nitrogen footprint, so to speak. Um, so reducing fertilizer is one, having natural habitat. So when you have pristine forest, actually that takes up a lot more nitrogen than does, say, a lawn, believe it or not, um, because it's naturally cycled through. Um, and then the, the, the issue of, of enhanced flushing, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a concept that continues to gain ground. You know, I think the new inlet in Great South Bay has taught us a lot of lessons. As I showed you what happened in Georgia Pond. Um, and I think if you look historically at the south shore of Long Island, um, before there were lots and lots of homes, we know that there were many inlets that were made. The Shinnecock Inlet that we have now is from 1938. But if you go back to the 18th century, it was significantly west of there. Uh, and then there were a time where we had no inlet whatsoever. So before we had a hardened south shore, it was very natural for these south shore bays and ponds to be breached by the ocean. Uh, and so I think going forward, I think there's going to be increasing awareness of that. And you know, I don't think we're there yet, but I do think that that idea may begin to gain some traction going forward. Yes? Is there anything that a homeowner can add to a septic system, flush, and the core that it could combine with the nitrogen and create something that would not be as dangerous to the environment? Well, that's a good question. And Probably nothing that can be flushed, but again, that's what the Clean Water Center for Clean Water Technology is really going to be focused on. Um, you know, there are products that you can buy that you can flush down the toilet. They may be good at removing the amount of organic matter. So, for example, if you have a septic a cesspool that's sort of backing up, um, but that doesn't remove the nitrogen. Um, but again, we're trying to look at simple things that can be done, like aeration uh, and other sorts of. Uh, things that can promote that process of denitrification. Um, 
I will, yeah, I'm not, I'm not an expert in septic tanks, but I do know that I've been told that you should get your, your systems pumped out every three years or so to make sure they're op functioning as optimally as possible. Bill. Um, Doctor, I always am amazed when I see either your data or the data on News 12 that the red and the black dots are in Shinnecock, and, and which, is, which is kind of counterintuitive to me. It would seem that our, where we are at this point in time, like we, should be, we should have less pollution, less black dots, less red dots compared to other areas in Nassau County on the North Shore. But it's always you know, black and red. So what gives? So remember, first thing I'll say, remember Shinnecock Bay is a gradient. And so when you go to the eastern part of the bay, some of the best water quality you can find on all of Long Island. There's no doubt about that. Robust fisheries, scallops, hard clams, eelgrass beds. The issue becomes the flushing issue. And as you move to the west, the further west you go, the longer it takes for that water to circulate out. And so we know in that western part of the bay that the, that's the area where the seagrass, you know, there's people in the audience here who have told me, oh yeah, growing up, this used to be seagrass beds, it's now mud. Uh, and, and there's a cycle there, I, I tried to emphasize that. You know, and they, oh, we used to clam, Ed Warner is here, we used to clam in Tiana Bay and other areas. You, know, you, you lose the habitat, you lose the keystone organisms, and things trickle down from there. So again, um, parts of Shinnecock Bay is the best water quality you can find. But as you go to the west, that's where the problems develop. And it's just a matter of the water. The, because the water is not circulating on a rapid basis, all that nitrogen that comes in on a daily basis has a longer and longer amount of time to work its ills within the system. Yeah. First off, uh, great work by you and all your students. Um, way back, we had a lot of duck farms uh, from Brookhaven uh, East. Have you looked at the sediments uh, to see if there's any nitrogen, you know, uh, locked in the sediments uh, that could be affected? You know, Forge River, a lot of duck farms there, uh, virtually any of the creeks. Uh, yeah, certainly there, there is what you would call, as you point out, legacy nitrogen within the sediments. Um, but what's actually interesting, at Stony Brook we did a study of, for example, the Forge River. And what's very interesting is, yes, we lost a lot of duck farms there. However, the number of people that have come in since then actually raised the nitrogen level far beyond what was lost by the duck farm. So um, there's the legacy, and then there's now more people. So there's been that sort of swap. Yes? What about this past winter with the snow? Like you talked about the big, heavy rains. Um, has, have the students done any kind of testing of the waters before all of the ice and the snow? Well, you know, that typically has an effect in the spring. And so, so, for example, the water temperatures are lower than they typically are this time of year. And so that sort of delays some of the things like the red tide that we study. Um, but, you know, that's, there was a lot of snow and ice cover, but it's historically not as unusual as, you, as, uh, as we might imagine. Yes, please. Thank you so much. It's really great to be in a room full of people that all share our concern about the water quality. And I really liked your points about the importance of the rainwater and the groundwater and how that seeps down so quickly. That's something that I have a really similar information about. But the first thing that happens is my concerns about what's happening in the ocean because the town board just voted in these townhouses that will have a nitrogen system, but the ground level water is not going to have any um, filtration of it. It'll go right into the canal, just like the canal. So what would you encourage all of us in this room to do to bring attention to those concerns about what's happening on our shores because, as you know, there's a lot of pressure for people to want to develop and live right along the beaches. How do we stop that? And because it doesn't seem that the town board members are hearing that, despite all this information. What do you suggest that we do? Well, I think that I think it's important that any sort of coastal development has adequate and advanced wastewater treatment and also appreciation for controlling runoff into coastal ecosystems. Um, you know, on the, on the recommend for that the runoff 
Well, it depends on the area, but you know, I, I, we've been talking a lot about salt marshes and, and, uh, and you know, having natural vegetation is always a plus. It protects you from flooding. It can intercept land-derived nutrients. Um, so a natural buffer of vegetation can be very important for can things I ask like you that. About that. Because, for example, is it possible that we could have efforts where we replant these salt marshes? Because there's been a loss of the the canal was originally a creek and had all those salt marshes, and it was changed to its more hardened structure. There, is there, that there are to yeah. Uh, well, I don't think we'll remove the canal per se, no, but, but some of the hard walls. Yeah, that is possible, and I know, for example, that the USGS is excuse me, not the USGS. The Army Corps of Engineers is considering areas in Shinnecock Bay for expanding uh, salt marshes, particularly on the ocean side. Mm -hmm. There, so that is a possibility. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Thank you for this evening. Um, my name is Jerry Collins, and I happen to be a member of the Conservation Board, and. Uh, every meeting we have applicants who come before us who look to push the limit on setbacks to septic systems and setbacks from the wetlands for structures and as much as you have stated in the beginning of your presentation that you, put, you mentioned the big oyster all right, when New York was the greatest oyster producer in the world and destroyed by the amount of raw sewerage going into New York Harbor, which is flushed quite a bit. But I guess my question is, if we were able to increase setbacks for septic systems, non-disturbance, non-fertilization areas, how much do you think that would help the nitrogen loading in our base? It, it certainly would help. You know, I think I, I would need to do a quantitative study to know how much. But certainly, the further back, um, the more buffer zone there is, the more that's going to intercept anything from the land going to the sea. And certainly, particularly for septic systems, you know, in those coastal zones, the level to groundwater is so close by that the closer you are, the greater the likelihood that the septic tank is actually in the water table. In which case, there's zero nitrogen removal, and it's direct communication to the bay via groundwater. Um, so it's very important. You know, I think the, I can't give you a quantitative number because uh, it's something that we'd have to look at uh, and probably on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but certainly both of those things, setbacks, and more important than setback is, that again, that depth to groundwater and having some area that the water can actually uh, go through and you can have natural retention of nitrogen. Um, that's important. Yes. You mentioned the uh, nitrogen loading impact on the salt marsh to show the root system. And I've seen this phenomenon of like a, a dieback where it actually is. Is that the cause of that, or is it something else? You know, it's going to be a case by case basis. Um, you know, there's and also it's going to it may vary across Long Island and certainly across the Northeast. So, for example, uh, in New England, there's an invasive crab that's a problem for their salt marshes. Uh, and someone said, oh, well, that's probably why we're losing them here. We don't have that crab here. So that's not the issue. Um, but there are other potential issues for salt marshes. For example, uh, you wanna, there needs to be a constant sediment supply to keep up with sea level rise. And if everything behind it is developed and you only have a skinny amount of marsh, it may not get the adequate sediment. Um, but again, the data is pretty clear. I know there's more data coming out about the nitrogen salt marsh link. So I wouldn't, I, I would be, um, I wouldn't say that's the only factor. Uh, but it's certainly a very important one uh, and potentially you know, the most or one of the most here in Long Island. I've, I've observed where you'll have a salt marsh and it's got the dieback and then 50 yards away the salt marsh is luxuriant. So you, you think of the same creek, it would be the same. Yeah, it, and it may depend on localized nitrogen loading. So for example, I'm aware of salt marshes in the Peconic Estuary where on the one bank, it's totally pristine and the marsh is doing great. On the other bank is where the development is, the fertilizer and the septic tanks, and that's where it's starting to erode. So that sometimes can account for some of the spatial variability, I believe. Yeah? Does that frag lightnings have anything to do with it in the basics that they change the small farms? Uh, certainly, Phragmites changes the characteristics of salt marshes and, um, and weakens their function. They're not as effective as removing nitrogen uh, as a natural salt marsh would be. And so if you have that sort of conversion over, uh, you lose that natural functioning that a salt marsh usually uh, 
uh, provides. And we've got, I see Judy throwing her hand up there. The Trachinides absorb more nitrogen than spartanum. I think it depends on how that nitrogen is being delivered. Well, Whether it's overland or via yeah, groundwater I flow. That is, you know, the, Aquifer um, there's been quite a few studies showing that pragmatics will sequester nitrogen and carbon dioxide uh, better and, and will also uh, help marshes elevate in the face of sea level rise. Which, but I will say actually, the studies show that in Long Island that people have looked, the marshes are generally keep, are keeping up with sea level rise, so that's not as much of an issue here. Yes, sir. We are so lucky to have the Marine Science Center out here because we would be walking around. <laughs> and and I have a question. I'm concerned about the hills and canoe points, and I, I read in the paper they want to install PRBs, <laughs> and I'm just not certain whether that's the only thing to do. So the gentleman asked about something known as PRBs, permeable, permeable reactive barriers, which are designed to intercept groundwater with nitrogen and denitrify it. And those have worked well in some locations. Uh, there's never been one installed on Long Island, so we don't know exactly how well it will work. Um, and they probably work well in a, they were designed for remediating uh, contaminated plumes and sites. So here's a plume, singular site, here's the contamination, we can put a barrier right in front of it and that should take care of things. Uh, and in fact, originally designed for things like industrial waste. Now, on Long Island, as I've shown you some of these maps, the nitrogen is very widespread. And so as soon as you move away from that direct source, um, what you'll be intercepting and how much you'll be intercepting is unclear. And further, as soon as you move away from the source, the likelihood of that nitrogen going below or around the barrier increases. And in fact, I will say I was at the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole earlier this year, and I met with some of the scientists who've done some of the pioneering research on this in the Northeast. Uh, and that was one of the things they found, is that yes, it can be effective, but there's a lot of open questions. The nitrogen can go underneath it. Um, you can have, if you're in an intertidal zone, you can have salt water going in that, that may alter the function. So, holds great potential, but we need to learn a lot more about it. Uh, somebody new there, sorry. Yeah, um, again, I'd like to thank you so much for all your efforts. And I, I would also like to add on to the question about uh, the permeable reactive barriers. Um, I think that the Marine Science Center is really Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of impact will that have, <clears throat> whether it's right now it's being proposed for CPI, now in the days, and, and it was being proposed for this concept, the whole issue of the so the, yeah, the water comes out different. There's changes in oxygen, alkalinity. Um, you know, I, because of the small nature of these barriers relative to the whole coastline, it shouldn't have a big effect on the overall ecosystem. But again, that speaks to the fact that if it's a small area of the whole coastline, it may only be solving a small fraction of the total problem. So I'll probably just take a couple of more questions. Um, Dan. So the Army Corps has a bunch of, I, of programs that they're starting now for some of the beach nourishment and stuff. That Part of that is the breach plan. What do you think the effects of that would be on some of the nitrogen loading issues? Because I know preventing some of the breach, closing up some of these new breaches can actually limit the flushing of a lot of the bays. Well, I think as of now, the Army Corps, the only remaining breach is that one in Great South Bay. And because, remember, during Hurricane Sandy, there were three breaches that formed. The Army Corps filled the two that, were, that they could, but they did not fill the one that's in Great South Bay because that's in the land of the National Park Service or Fire Island National Seashore. And so they wanted to fill it, but they couldn't. And I think the Park Service, they're, they're going through the process, but I know that they don't want to close it. So, and I'm, my... My guess, having studied it since it formed, is I think it's going to be left to go natural. That's what my crystal ball is telling me. Yeah. 
I know their current plan is any breach, they will close it immediately regardless. Right. But except that they don't have jurisdiction in the national parks. So, yes. Uh, two quick questions. One is, uh, or, well, um, fantastic work, uh, but uh, do you ever question the timing of, of your speeches, meaning, um, and, and the events that are taking place right now? For example, uh, the county's about ready to spend money on this stuff, and, um, the, and so is the state. Um, so, and we've just had a big controversy in Nassau County with Dean Skelos and water treatment. Uh, so my question is, have you given that any thought as to the timing and the delivery of what you're presenting now? And the reason I'm making you conscious of this is because there is an opening now and you would make a wonderful politician because you're unbiased. <laughs> so that's my question. Uh, no comment on both. <laughs> All right, last question, sir. Sure, Dr. Uh, to help mitigate roof runoff, you know, in high density populated areas, like on condominiums, you know, on uh, waterfront properties, what type of, uh, you know, natural plantings would you recommend, you know, to uh, help mitigate that situation? You know, it's a little out of my area of expertise. As I said, natural vegetation can help re uh, absorb and remediate runoff and nutrients from that, but um, I think you'd have to go to a uh, landscaping expert for, for some of the details. I'm sorry about that. But with that, I'll thank you for your attendance. I'll remind you we're going to have lectures again on May 1st and June 5th. I encourage you to, to attend those. If you're not on our email list, I encourage you to email to sign up on our email list. It's on the tables that are out there. Uh, and if you have the energy, I encourage you to go speak with the graduate students about their projects. And if there's any unanswered questions, I'd be happy to talk about that now. Thank you and good night.